I'm going to introduce the next speaker um, that, that will speak about one particular project uh, in, in, in particular, or, or his experience in one project. Um, the next speaker is actually Alex Fry, who is a compositing and color pipeline supervisor who has spent the last 15 years making Pictures Awesome and Pixels Pretty at Animal Logic, Dr. D Studios, Rising Sun Pictures, Weta Digital, and Fin Design and Effects. Alex was the driving force behind Aces on the Lego movie at Animal Logic and has gone on to implement ACES on a variety of projects ranging from television commercials to summer blockbusters. So ACES um, on uh, the Lego movie was um, a point in time in the, in the development of ACES uh, adoption at Animal Logic themselves, but please help me to welcome Alex Fry. Okay, so uh, why did we use ACES on the Lego movie? Basically, there were two main issues we were trying to solve. Uh, the nature of Lego is that it's very brightly colored and highly reflective. Uh, so we've got lots of really highly saturated objects being hit with really bright, highly saturated lights. Uh, so we needed a more robust display transform to be able to handle those extreme values. Uh, the second issue we had was uh, the film's actually made up of a few different types of material. We've got the production CG shots, which are probably 90% of the film that was being done in-house at Animal Logic. There's a couple of live action sequences that were shot here uh, on the Ari Alexa, and there's this very cool end title sequence done by Alma Mata, um, shot on Canon 5D Mark III as live action stop motion. Uh, and it's not just a matter of us trying to get all of those things on the screen at the same time. We want to render them with the same aesthetic. You know, we, we don't want to have a situation where we have one display transform for the CG, Ari LUTs for the Ari stuff, and then maybe Canon picture rendering for the uh, stills material. We want the whole thing to be passing through the exact same rendering pipeline um, to, to make it to the screen and all blend as it should. Um, so I'm briefly going to touch on what ACES is. Uh, it's an acronym, and there's sort of two variations on that acronym. There's the Academy Color Encoding Specification. This is ACES The Color Space. Uh, it's ultra-wide gamut, which is good for our super-saturated LEGO. It's high dynamic range, so we can handle our crazy highlights that we have everywhere. It's standardized, so we can deal with other facilities, and it's RGB. You know, it's not XYZ, it's not a technical connecting space, it's something we can do work in. Uh, this is the diagram I'm sure you've all seen, comparing uh, Rec. 709, P3 and ACES in YXY. Uh, and there's the second use of the ACES acronym, the Academy Color Encoding System. This is the, the workflow or the framework. Um, and this is the, the basic block diagram that makes it up. We go from something on the left, it kind of doesn't really matter. We pass through an input device transform. Uh, so that takes whatever combination we had on the on the left side of that frame, you know, it could be log, could be this color space, could be that color space. We standardize and conform that all to the scene linear ultra wide gamut ACES space. We do stuff to it in that space. Uh, and then on the way to the screen, we pass through two transforms. Uh, the reference rendering transform, which is the look of ACES, it's sort of the virtual film stock, if you will. And the output device transform, which is the uh, the technical transform to get you to a specific real world display device. So the RRT puts out something that would be displayed on an imaginary perfect display that had uh, you know, infinite gamut and infinite dynamic range, and then the ODT cuts it down to something that we can display on a real device. Uh, so for our production, we had the production CG, the IRE live action stuff, and the 5D Mark III. So it breaks down a little bit like this. We have LEGO P3, which is our internal working space. We had a custom IDT uh, developed by Alex Forsyth at the Academy. He gave that to us. We were able to use that to transform our production CG material into ACES. We had the RE Alexa stuff, which we received in as RE RAW files and then debayed directly in Nuke straight to ACES. And uh, then we had the 5D Mark III material that had no existing IDT at the time, so we cooked up a little solution to that, which I'll we'll go into a little bit later. Uh, on the back end of that, we have a number of different outputs. So for quick times, for editorial, uh, for certain sorts of reviews, we would use the Rec. 709 ODT and bake those into quick times. Uh, so people in editorial can see the same thing we're seeing. Uh, artist desktops are using the P3 DCI ODT on dream colors running in P3 emulation mode. Uh, and also for our um, DCI spec reference theaters within the facility. 
And then for our final uh, theat theatrical deliverable, we use the DCDM uh, ODT, which is uh, XYZ space. And sort of unlike a normal kind of RGB P3 workflow, that XYZ deliverable isn't bound to the normal P3 primary. So we actually have even more elbow room than we would normally have. So how have we done it previously? Um, prior to this point, shows that Animal had used a combination of a few different specs. So our working space was seen linear P3 DCI but we were borrowing parts of the REC 709 spec for the, the display transform, basically using the camera uh, transform curve uh, to take our scene linear data and then gamma correct it. The catch here is that um, even if you're working completely scene linear and you're not clipping your data, it sort of doesn't really matter because you're only seeing that zero to one range down the bottom. So everyone's inclination on their desktops or in the review theater is to bring everything down to sit below one. Uh, and you very quickly end up going from something that is theoretically scene linear to something that's actually display linear. You're not representing the light in the scene, you're representing the light coming out of the screen, which is not the same thing. It's a much narrower chunk of information. It's a perfectly valid way of working. You can make very pretty pictures, but you're reliant on the artists um, much more directly to kind of get that realistic result. And in a shot like that, for instance, uh, even though the data is initially seen linear, we've kind of corrupted that by bringing things down to get them all into range. So that sun up the back isn't actually much brighter than the light hitting the owl's face because they both have to you know, sit under one in linear scale. So here I'm just going to illustrate the difference uh, between the two uh, display transforms. So here's a, obviously a not production quality little test render I've got with a couple of Lego figures, brightly saturated outfits. And this is the scene linear raw render before any display transform has been applied. Now, on the right-hand side of the screen, I'm going to use a standard sRGB display transform. This would be the default you would get if you fire up Nuke or most um, frame viewing applications. Uh, it's just a, it's not the same as the Rec. 709 one, but it's so close for the purposes of this exercise, it's going to show the same things. Uh, and then we're going to display that on screen. On the left-hand side, we're going to pass through a very simple ACES IDT, simply assigning reassigning sRGB primaries to sit within the wider gamut ACES primaries. From that point, we're now in scene linear ACES. We're going to pass through the RRT and then through an sRGB ODT and then display on screen. So left side is ACES display pipeline, right hand side is sRGB display pipeline. If we drop down a stop, you'll see that they're both still holding together fine. Um, the one on the left appears a little bit darker because of the slightly different toe uh, in the ACES display transform, but they're both still okay. But if we jump up a stop, you'll see that even with only one stop of overexposure, we've started to clip in some fairly nasty ways on the image on the right. We've lost detail on the aqua guy's pants, uh, and the, a lot of the subtle detail on the head's been lost straight away. If we go up two stops, you can see it just gets worse. The image on the left is overexposed, but it's still photographically plausible. Uh, whereas on the right, we've started to get into sort of pop art territory. Uh, if we keep going, you'll see that it just gets worse. And once we get up to this sort of level, you'll notice we're not just losing information on the right, we're also sort of overemphasizing other pieces of information. So the shadow, the guy with the, with the red shirt, the shadow his arm is casting on his chest has been completely lost in the image on the right. And we've overemphasized this reflection pass that's in there as well. Now this is the same render in both cases, we're just displaying it differently. Uh, and as we keep going, it gets worse and worse and worse. Once we get up to sort of nine, ten stops, you'll see that the image on the left is completely blown out, as it probably should. Uh, and the image on the right has, is still hanging around, and we're just seeing this horrible noise from the bottom end of the render. Uh, so we, we lost information that we wanted to keep really early, and now we're keeping information that we probably don't want to see at this point. Uh, the same thing happens when we throw lots of colour into the scene, so this could be coming from highly saturated lights or it could be coming from really heavy grades in the comp or it could be happening in the DI suite. And really, whichever way we push the image, you'll notice one of the guys breaks. We can't really push very far in any direction without hitting the limits of our uh, display transform. So, not suitable for bright stuff, not suitable for super heavy grades. Uh, how about a high dynamic range 1D transform? Uh, candidates for this could be the SPI Anim curve, which ships with OCIO. We just finished on Gatsby. We could have used Red Gamma 2. We had existing stuff set up for that. Uh, we could have tried to match to our ARI stuff and used one of the ARI 1D transforms, or we could have just made something up and come up with a new in-house one. 
So again, left-hand side, ACES Display Pipeline, right-hand side, SBI Animus, uh, SRGB Film Curve. Uh, as we go up, you'll see that the image on the right hangs together longer, but we've really just kind of delayed the problem. We still run into the same issues after a certain point. Now, another option might have been using a 3D film emulation LUT. Um, you know, I've worked on other CG features where we've done that, but there's a couple of catches there. You know, A, you kind of limit yourself to, uh, you know, what film could actually display, and you that's not desirable for a CG feature. Uh, and it's also very hard to pull the thing apart once you've got it. You've just got this great big blob of data. Uh, and it's hard to tell, okay, this funny kink that we've got here, is that to do with the stock itself or the measurements someone took or some tweak someone's made when they're baking the LUT out? Uh, you can't tweak that one little thing later on. Whereas the R10, the ODT are open source software. You can read through line by line by line by line and see exactly what's going on. Uh, and if you have some special circumstance, you can modify it. Um, so, for instance, I worked on another project where we were targeting the Oculus DK2. Uh, it's a, an OLED display, it's ultra-wide gamut, uh, but it doesn't really match up to any of the other specs, so it's wider in two directions and not quite as wide as P3 in the other direction and has this weird shifted blue white point. We're just able to modify the ODT and then have something that targets that display uh, specifically. Um, another nice thing about ACES was being able to reference our sort of assumptions back to the real world. So. Everyone knows what Lego looks like. You know, you have a sense of what the colors should be. Uh, so we're able to take a physical Macbeth chart uh, and then use a 5D Mark II IDT the Academy supplied uh, to pull that in and confirm that, yes, our Macbeth actually does match up to this uh, idealized synthetic Macbeth chart. Uh, once we're confident that that's working, we can take a photograph of this thing here, the Lego chip chart. So this is every color the Lego factory made in the year 2013. Uh, so the entire universe of the Lego movie is made of just these colors. So if we get these right, we get everything right. Uh, and sure enough, we're getting a nice good match, uh, so we can be confident that things are behaving as they should. So when I came onto the show, we were too far along to kind of make a wholesale switch to ACES. Too many things were already in play. Uh, so we came up with this idea of a Lego P3 working space. Uh, and this was a variation on what we'd done previously, but uh, sort of redefined by its relationship to ACES. So it's seen linear, P3 primaries, but with a D60 white point. And we're saying that uh, we've got the same white point, unity values are still the same, and the correct way to view this image is through the rest of the ACES pipeline. Uh, so we have our working space, and we have a simple three by three matrix to flip between the two, and we can go backwards and forwards as many times as we want. As long as we don't clip the bottom end while we're in LEGO P3, uh, we can still access the full range of ACES data, but we're compatible with our previous workflows. Uh, so for instance, we take our RE raw data, we debay that to ACES, but then we flip through the inverse of our LEGO P3 IDT, uh, and then store that data on disk in the LEGO P3 space. So it's still effectively an ACES file, but we're just storing it differently. And then on the back end, we invert that same transform and then go through the RT and the ODT. Because ACES is nice and modular, it's easy to kind of swap little bits out if you need to for whatever reason, because it, things have got defined start and end points in the workflow. Uh, so why does scene linearity matter? Uh, this is a production shot from the film. Um, you'll notice that we've got, a big part of the look of the movie is the optical effects. We've got bright pings coming off his head, we've got nice stuff. Uh, and yeah, a nice contrast image, but it's still a legitimate scene linear image. If we look at the raw data like that without any display transform, you can see that we've got a lot of stuff that's sitting well over one. If we look at that same data through the standard Rec. 709 tone curve, you can see that we've sort of, we've overemphasized the bottom end of the image, we're completely clipping out in a whole bunch of places, and just generally it doesn't look that hot. Uh, now you might go, okay, well, I, the lighting or compositing artist, would uh, fix that. I would dial certain passes up and down. I'd add a little bit of a curve. I'd tweak all the things and make it sit within that zero to one range. And then when we get to the end of the process and chuck on our optical effects, not much happens because there isn't any range in the image anymore. That ping on his hair is now sitting at one, not at 50 or whatever it was before. Uh, if we then look at that same image in its true, true scene linear state, you can see that we're getting a whole bunch of things for free because our data represents the real world, not the light leaving the screen. And we can also pull the image around, drop it down three stops, and the whole thing still looks like it should. 
you know, we've still got range at the top end, we haven't clipped anywhere, and we can push three stops up the other way, we haven't done anything funny to the bottom end, you know, rolling a little toe into our comp to make it look nicer through the uh, standard Rec 709, trans uh, Rec 709 transform. And uh, we can chuck all these effects on in a global way. You know, we don't have to ask artists to, you know, pull a little key on his hair to then add a ping off that. You know, that convolution filter is being run over the entire image everywhere. So the blacks are smearing into each other in the same way that the bright parts are, um, much like it should in the real world. You know, things don't suddenly start flaring after a cert certain point. They flare everywhere all the time. Uh, and so the attitude, you know, if you want to make that ping brighter, you just make the object brighter in the scene and it will behave correctly. Uh, it's much easier to get a consistent look over the whole film if you're not asking people to make per shot aesthetic decisions like that. You just expose the few controls that you need and uh, not anymore. Uh, so we end up with a sequence that looks like this. You know, we've got really bright, punchy lights bouncing around everywhere. Those you know, light sources that are streaming in through the window can have nice high values that they need to then hit the wall, bounce back into the rest of the room uh, and behave as they should. Uh, and I think it'd be great. It's a nice photographic result. Uh, and a lot of that is down to the display transform. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was DI. Um, traditionally in CG features, it sounds a bit silly, but DI is actually the lowest quality point in the chain. We've gone from having you know, effectively infinite dynamic range, uh, perfect fidelity, everything's floating point, and then suddenly we chop it down, flip it into log, you know, take the 0 to 13 slice out of that data and drop down to 10 bits. Uh, and you know, it's, it's a pity. We've maintained all of that data all the way through and suddenly we, we lose a whole bunch of it. So on this film, because we were using ACES, we were able to uh, stay in scene linear floating point all the way through. We would bake in that IDT, hand that off to uh, the internal DI suite, which is a Nucoda, uh, as regular ACES EXRs. They would work on that data, and then rather than rendering out the final DCDM deliverable, they would bake out ACES EXRs, and we would use our farm, which is now empty because the film's finished, uh, to bake out the various deliverables. So the DCDM one, the Rec. 709 one, and sort of most interestingly, the ACES archive got packed away for the future. You know, we'd seen the Dolby PRM, we knew HDR was a thing, but it was still far enough in the future that it wasn't really something we could do anything about now. But by archiving that ACES uh, version, we left the possibility open for a HDR re remaster in the future, which has happened, as from what I hear. Um, it was also really useful for interfacing with other companies. Uh, we did the first trailer with Photochem. Uh, we were able to give them ACES EXRs and not have to worry about giving them a whole pile of LUTs and instructions on how to use them. We could just say, this stuff is ACES. They can load it up in whatever system they were using, I think a Pablo, and work with it there. Uh, we were getting a whole bunch of post-convert stuff done for the live action sequences at Legend 3D. We would bake in our uh, IDT, give them ACES frames. They would give us back ACES frames, and then we would invert it again for storage within our system. And uh, Technicolor dealt with the final film out, so we gave them the raw ACES frames and they dealt with burning in the RT and the ODT within their particular film out pipeline. Uh, there was also another company called Amamata who did the sequence, the end credit sequence of the film. So this was all live action stop motion shot on a Canon 5D Mark III. There was no IDT for that camera at the time. I don't know if there is now. Uh, so we came up with this slightly hacky but totally workable solution to get uh, their raw files into ACES. Uh, so we would load the CR2s directly in Nuke, we'd set a couple of flags to tell DC raw to debay a scene linear XYZ space, uh, and then from there go from XYZ straight to ACES. So we're not being clipped to sRGB or even Profoto, we're just going direct XYZ to ACES. Uh, and then once you throw the display transform on that, you get something like that. Uh, and their final sequence ended up looking like this. You know, it's a completely different way to produce uh, moving Lego, but because it's being rendered through the same display transforms, it aesthetically matches the rest of the film. And I think that's about it from me. Uh, so if you want to find Animal, they're there. And yeah, that's it. Great. Cool. Thank you.